for joining our cardiology YouTube channel today. And uh, I have the pleasure today of uh, having uh, Dr. Gross, uh, one of my colleagues in the AP section here presenting. Dr. Gross uh, is a graduate uh, of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He received uh, all his postgraduate training in Montefiore, where he went from being uh, you know, a medical student to a professor of medicine. He has uh, uh, here built uh, all his career in the field of uh, pacing and electrophysiology. He has been uh, lucky enough to see the field growing by being uh, the right arm of Dr. Furman, which uh, first developed the cephalic vein approach for the implant of a pacemaker all over the world. So Jay has been lucky enough to see the evolution of the pacing and of the electrophysiology over the years. He has been investigator in many pacemaker, ICD, and electrophysiology study, and uh, has uh, here going to present what is the cardiac resynchronization therapy in 2021 going to be, which are the evolving perspective. He has uh, seen the whole field, uh, you know, evolving from no cardiac resynchronization therapy to resynchronization therapy. He has implanted a lot of these devices. He also has specialized during his career also in the extraction of the infected devices, devices becoming a leader in the field in the area and not only. So it's my pleasure to give the word and the um, start of this presentation to Dr. Gross. Jay, please. Luigi, uh, thank you uh, for that warm introduction. And it's really a pleasure and honor to have the opportunity um, to share my perspective on CRT today. Um, I want to sort of recount a little bit of the history, give a sense of where we are today, focus on some of the struggles and areas that we really don't understand or understand only partially, and then um, spend a little time talking about where we're hoping to head. I have no specific conflicts uh, to report uh, on this um, presentation. There will be a couple of off-label uh, uh, products that are mentioned, um, uh, which are being mentioned as potential uh, approaches of the future. So I thought it was fairly, uh, it's a good time to, to review this topic. One can argue uh, when the story of CRT starts, and I'll, I'll relate to it, but perhaps the first thing that really put it on the map was this article 20 years ago from uh, mostly uh, French and European investigators really begin to focus on using biventricular pacing as a means to treat patients who have heart failure and intraventricular conduction delays. struggle just a little bit here. Um, so it's rather odd for us to really, as to electrophysiologists, to be talking about this area. We're kind of all or nothing, instant gratification type of individuals. You either have capture with a pacemaker or you don't. Uh, you either hit the critical point in the cable tricuspid isthmus terminating atrial flutter, or you don't. Uh, you're blading a pathway, and when you're there, the delta waves go away nearly instantaneously, and the AVs separate, and you know you've done your job. Even the areas such as atrial fibrillation, which are areas still evolving, um, even if the uh, cure of AF might be uncertain, but the endpoints to try to establish that cure, that is, for instance, isolating and demonstrating that you've isolated a pulmonary vein, also is very precise and not really open to negotiation whether you've isolated it or not. Heart failure, on the other hand, is a different world. And the management of heart failure is a different world. And the mechanisms that are involved in heart failure are too complex 
and too numerous to even start to allude to in this discussion. And I'm thankful that my heart failure colleagues who are far, far more sophisticated and wise than us in this regard are involved and front and center to CRT. But historically, it's not really where it started. It really started with the electrophysiologists. And it started with the idea that we knew we were putting in devices to treat people with heart failure, but we were treating the consequences of the heart failure. We were treating bradyarrhythmias, we were trying to prevent sudden death, but we really weren't doing very much at all about treating the underlying cause, which is sort of frustrating. You're in the heart, you're putting wires in the heart, you'd like to be able to treat the underlying disease if at all possible. And it was also noted that heart failure patients with systolic heart failure and wide QRSs as a rule had worse prognosis than those without IVCDs. And certainly um, in my early days of fellowship and early days as an attending, we dreamt of drugs that could enhance inotropic response. Um, and there was a lot of excitement um, early on about that. But, uh, you know, the history is that most uh, drugs that are designed to focus on inotropy usually worsen clinical outcome. And so if we could find a machine to enhance inotropy, maybe it would be different. So the first focus on trying to make things better was really looking at the EKG and people had noticed, uh, particularly in the Mayo Clinic and in Europe, that patients with heart failure with long PR intervals had a worse prognosis. And that even with right ventricular pacing in patients with very long PR intervals, one could demonstrate a hemodynamic benefit. This suggested that normalizing the AV delay and taking a step further, normalizing AV timing, particularly on the left side of the heart, could hemodynamically help people. Biventricular started to focus on more than just AV timing optimization, but perhaps VV uh, timing optimization between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And then finally, the appreciation of trying to normalize conduction and electrical activation uh, within the various parts of the left ventricle. But in the beginning, and this is what I used to call it, I used to call it EMD, that's the term we used in our youth, or now called pulseless electrical activity. The electrophysiologist started this. And uh, we started to demonstrate some very nice electrical phenomenon but when it came to really proving whether we were actually helping heart failure patients or not, we really weren't using the right endpoints and we weren't doing the right investigations. And finally, when electrical mechanical association finally was established between the heart failure experts and EP, that's where CRT really took off. And a, a numerous major randomized, double-blinded controlled trials were done in collaboration between the electrophysiologists and the heart failure experts with an emphasis on using endpoints that have been used for decades or at least years by the heart failure experts to determine whether what you thought you were trying to accomplish you actually were. And it's really that collaborative approach along with improved operator experience and major technologic advances that have really allowed CRT to become an established form of therapy. So uh, there's a spectrum of, uh, of CRT, CRT believers and not, but I think everybody would admit that treating uh, in particular systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction poses a major challenge and that many patients, if they could be given additional modalities of treatment, 
uh, would be would benefit, particularly IBCD patients who seem to have a worse prognosis. And the trials that have been done are striking. They're striking in two ways. That is, there are many, many parameters that are used to measure efficacy in the treatment of heart failure, which have been studied in these studies. And not only have they, by and large, been very positive, but the magnitude of the response has been, when you compare it to some of the major pharmacologic success stories, in some respects, um, uh, are more robust or more dramatic. And CRT really provided that paradigm change in which you could treat systolic heart failure with inotropic support without being proarrhythmic and without causing increased work of the heart. And here's just um, a slide to show you looking at changes of uh, beta blocker trials comparing it to a DIG, which was basically a placebo, but then if, uh, comparing those benefits compared to CRT, for instance, in six minute walk, um, in quality of life scores, in uh, cardiopulmonary um, duration, and showed how striking the effect of CRT could be. And if you look at uh, the mortality benefits in ACE, uh, studies and ARBs and beta blockers, CRT impact on mortality is a very, very impressive response. So not only did we now have a new modality pursuing a different way to manage heart failure, but we also had demonstrable benefits in many, many different types of parameters, uh, both subjective and objective, uh, in which CRT was shown to be a potent force in the right patient population. And the magnitude of that impact was potentially very, very substantial. And that has really allowed CRT now to be an established form of treatment in the management of patients with uh, depressed LV function with conduction abnormalities. And we'll go into a little bit more about the specifics of some of these conduction abnormalities. As I am through the rest of the talk, going to take a step back and try to put things in perspective, CRT is hardly a panacea. But before I focus on this picture, I wanna just issue a non-apology for CRT. CRT has a non-response rate. So do drugs. So do every modality of treatment that we have. And it's true whether it's heart failure or diabetes or hypertension. So the fact that CRT is being demonstrated to have a non-response rate is not a shock. It's what is to be expected. I also want to point out that most patients who are getting CRT devices as an initial implant are also getting an ICD to prevent sudden cardiac death. So it's not as though they're undergoing an invasive treatment exclusively for CRT, but at least for those undergoing an initial implant are going, undergoing a invasive procedure that provides them with a 95% protection from sudden cardiac death. So it's simply adding the extra step for CRT. So I wanna make sure that that, you know, many people's minds say, well, it's acceptable if you have a non-response to, to a beta block or an ACE inhibitor, but not to an invasive device. So I just wanted to put that in perspective. But CRT is not perfect. And so um, if you look at this curve and you say, this is the natural course of, uh, of a cohort of heart failure patients, um, some of these patients, and we can argue whether it's 50%, 60%, 70% will be responders. They will actually do better after they receive their CRTs. And a small percentage will be super responders, either because they truly are super responders to CRT, but perhaps had regression of their disease uh, independent of CRT. 
sort of a lost group that isn't fully appreciated. And maybe the, the made it CRT group in particular um, uh, belongs to this group. And maybe one day, if we use CRT at earlier stages of LV dysfunction, we'll, we'll get a lot of people who don't necessarily get better, but importantly, over time, they don't get worse. But 30 or 40% are going to fall into this category, depending how you define it. And a very small percentage are actually going to do worse with CRT. Fortunately, if you identify them, the, the cure is simply to turn off the switch to uh, deactivate the LV lead. But it does put into perspective of where CRT impacts and where it does not. So admittedly, 30 or 40% will be non-responders depending on how one defines it. Uh, when one does post-hack analysis of large randomized trials, you can very well, or to a degree, sort out those patients who are likely not to benefit. Uh, we've recognized that women in general respond better than men, non-schemics better than ischemics. Um, and when we've tried to go out of our current understanding, we've often been met with frustration in trying to find new groups of patients who we can help. And um, we're going to have to deal with a new aspect of electromechanical dissociation. That is not a dissociation between the heart failure and EP worlds, which fortunately, I think we have an extraordinary collaborative uh, approach to, but looking at the ideas of the electrical guidance on deciding how and where to put CRT devices and the mechanical results that happen or don't happen or are measured uh, remain part of the mystery of CRT. And so even when we're done with this whole discussion, and even when we're done with this discussion in three or four years from now, I still think we're gonna have a lot of things that we don't fully understand. So how can we improve outcomes right now of CRT patients? Well, number one is uh, sort of the negative, but an important one. And that is, if we know there are patients who do not have electrical dyssynchrony, don't try to fix them with electrical synchronous devices. It's not gonna work. Uh, we're not gonna really get into this much today, but what would be exciting is to identify patients who we don't know uh, are uh, uh, currently benefiting from CRT, but perhaps eventually will. And that's gonna be a critical part of the story because if only one third of patients uh, with depressed ejection fraction heart failure uh, qualifies for CRT, and if we tighten those criteria, perhaps less, and just for simple numbers, say only 50% of those patients benefit, then we're really talking about impacting only on 15% of the heart failure population. Uh, that is the heart failure patient, heart failure population with depressed ejection fractions. And that's a little bit sobering. And it would be nice uh, over time if we can get better at identifying populations that we do not yet provide CRT but might benefit. We're going to talk about uh, finding better places to put the lead in the hope, particularly uh, using advanced imaging, to help us decide where we might be able to help better people more effectively by our implant technique. Um, something that's a little bit under the radar but is often underappreciated is that we know that if we don't deliver by V about 92% of the time in CRT patients, they get a sub standard response to CRT. So the management of suppressing um, or curing atrial fibrillation or ventricular ectopy has moved more to the forefront to try to enhance by V pacing by eliminating or at least suppressing competing arrhythmias that prevent effective delivery of by V pacing. And then we'll talk um, and focus on a little bit on improving technology and see if that too can improve outcomes. 
And then finally, at the very end, we'll talk about a very different way to look at cardiac resynchronization and see if that might be the wave of the future. So in this day and age, it might be dangerous to show a picture of a US president, but I'll feel uh, safe to show th Thomas Jefferson's picture because when he said these words, he wasn't yet president. Uh, this is in the Declaration of Independence and mentioned that we hold these truths to be self-evident. So these are some of the truths we hold to be self-evident right now in CRT. Left bundle branch block is the best marker for patients who may respond. The longer the QRS duration, the more likelihood of the response. Non-ischemics more than ischemics. Uh, women greater than men. And so let me focus on the first two truths. Are left bundle branch block patients all going to benefit? Are all QRS duration uh, patients with very long QRSs benefit? So let's look at that a little more carefully. So here's sort of a picture of the sliding scale of efficacy, you might say. So if you're a dilated cardiomyopathy, a non-ischemic, a left bundle, and a cure restoration of greater than 150 milliseconds, you have an excellent chance of being a responder. As you move from left bundle to other conduction abnormalities, as the QRS duration shrinks, as the proportion of, of non-ischemics to ischemics goes up, efficacy goes down. So we know that looking at this picture, left bundle branch block and cure restoration are very, very important markers for predicting response. But let's just look at left bundle branch block critically for a moment. And these are you know, traditional definitions of left bundles. And you would think left bundle should, should be a home run. But we know there are plenty of left bundle branch patients that do not respond. And um, this goes back even as far back as 2004. Arikio is really one of the great thinkers over the years on CRT, thinker and doer. Uh, notice that about a third of patients who we call left bundle patients have a left bundle pattern on their EKG. But when you look at RV, LV timing, they don't act the way we would think of somebody with a left bundle. And if there is no delayed LV endocardial activation, putting a wire in the LV endocardium is not likely to make the patients better. And so the definitions of um, left bundles that are likely to respond have been modified or at least suggested to be modified in which the QS or RS morphology in V1 should be apparent in V2 as well. One should use a cure restoration of 140 milliseconds for men and 130 milliseconds for women. So that we're not just looking at LVH that grew into a wider QRS, but true electrical delay. And that there's evidence of mid QRS notching that really supports the concept that there truly is intraventricular electrical delay. And so we want to find the left bundle patients where the timing differences really are substantial, as opposed to patients that are normal or left bundles, uh, patients that mimic electrical delay, but don't really have it. This is now being taken a step further. Not only can you enhance criteria for predicting which left bundles really are more likely to respond to CRT, but also looking at cure restoration. And arguments that cure restoration predicts a population, but not necessarily any given individual, with a suggestion that cure restoration is a crude EKG parameter for measuring intraventricular delay. But using a QRS area or QRST area, one could better define those patients who truly have uh, intraventricular electrical delay versus those that do not. And the hope is with things like AI that we will eventually have ways to look at EKGs in ways that we haven't in the past 
and really separate out those who truly have electrical delay uh, in the LV and those who do not, and perhaps come up with not only identifying patients who left bundles and long QRSs who may not benefit, but also identifying patients who may not have a left bundle or appear to have a shorter QRS delay um, uh, duration, but still actually have substantial delay. And so we might, on the one hand, shrink the non-responders out of a population that we thought should respond, but also include now patients who we previously excluded. And so that's one of the hopes of the future from an electrical uh, perspective of trying to better identify patients who are likely to respond to CRT. So we all knew early on, even the electrophysiologists, that the EKG pattern was a very poor surrogate for what we're really after. We're not trying to fix the EKG. We're trying to fix the pump. We're trying to eliminate mechanical dyssynchrony between the free wall and the septum. And um, while an EKG is fun, the real money is in looking at where the mechanical delays are. And uh, certainly we've gotten much and much more sophisticated in the world of imaging. I don't know if there are any imaging folks on here who have an opportunity to comment uh, later on, but we thought that imaging was in the end gonna be a much better story of identifying potential CRT responders and not. I had the um, honor and in retrospect, the infamy to be part of the ECHO CRT trial, uh, which said just that very point. We're not going to restrict CRT to patients with a wider or narrow QRS. What we're really going to do is look at even patients with a narrow QRS and look pre-procedurally whether they have mechanical dyssynchrony or not. And this was the early days of perhaps advanced uh, echo imaging to look for mechanical dyssynchrony, but um, still it was done in core labs with really great uh, echocardiographers. Uh, Montefiore recruited very well for this trial. And the hope was that we were going to find a whole bunch of new patients we could make better. As it turned out, we failed miserably, not only despite having mechanical dyssynchrony on these studies, did we not make the population better, but there was a disturbing increase in mortality in the group randomized to LV on uh, in this group. And this really uh, shook us and told us that um, this crude EKG amazingly seems to be better, at least in the first studies, on using echo guidance to define patients who might be CRT beneficiaries. Um, the PROSPECT trial was a very elegant trial looking at a series of non-invasive parameters to try to identify dyssynchrony and then predict in patients who got CRTs uh, how well these parameters were at predicting outcome. And the conclusion was that the prospect trial showed no, no prospect. That is using those parameters, they could not identify ways to predict who would respond to CRT by using mechanical measures of dyssynchrony. So why is that? And there's gonna be no answer at the end of today's discussion, but there's at least some basis, some of it. Well, some of it is actually not that surprising, particularly in ischemics. Just because an area activates late doesn't mean that it can be reactivated. Um, uh, what was a, an expression that I had learned in my youth? Red, uh, you need red meat if you want to beat. Uh, and so if you try to pace an area that is scarred, 
or even if you can capture locally but can't really depolarize tissue adjacent to it, you can't really resynchronize that side. And therefore, if we're going to use parameters of mechanical delay, you must take into account not only whether these are areas that activate left, late, but whether they are viable. And um, we're going to focus on this a little bit more uh, shortly. Another way that we tried to use non-invasive information was to do what seemed to be uh, absolutely logical to do. It harkened back to the early days where it was perceived that CRT was a lot about normalizing left-sided diastolic filling, uh, not encroaching on diastolic filling, not leading to preventing pre-systolic MR. And in the early trials, AV optimization was actually one of the things that was required to be done in initiating CRT. And to a lesser extent, VV optimization, both from a coordination of, of, of interventricular coordination, but also intraventricular coordination. Um, and there was a lot of focus on that. And this too has turned out to be very frustrating that whether one used empiric settings or one used electrical device-based algorithms to set your timing, echo-guided information by and large did not enhance income, um, outcome, perhaps advance some income for the non-invasive doctors, but not outcome for the patients. All is not lost in imaging and CRT. Um, if you think about it, it's impossible that we eventually won't have a better understanding of what we're looking at from an imaging perspective and what we're achieving from a CRT perspective. And in fact, there are at least a couple of trials. These are two of the most prominent trials, the START and TARGET trials. That suggested that one could pick the area in the heart where you wanted to put your lead, that these are the areas more likely to respond. And if one got to that spot, one could predict a better outcome. And in fact, uh, these are two trials that support it. One could take it a step further. One could say, you know what we really need? We need multiple modalities. We need a CT that shows us venous anatomy we need an MRI to convincingly show us where there's scar. And we need speckle tracking to tell us where our latest point of activation are. And perhaps with this combined approach, might be expensive, might be complicated, but perhaps we can really make a difference in predicting where we should put the leads and getting better outcome. So, Scandinavians have actually done a lot of work and a lot of the early work on imaging and CRT. And this was a study uh, from Sweden. This is from um, this past year. And it looked at that combined approach. Um, there were little glimmers of positivity in the approach, but overall in their randomized controlled study, despite multi-modality imaging studies to try to direct where one should put the lead intraoperatively, the outcomes were not significantly changed. At least most of the parameters of a measuring outcome were not enhanced. Also, one has to remember that as long as we're delivering leads through the veins, even if I knew exactly where I should go, doesn't mean that I can get there. I need a vein to get there. It has to be the right anatomy that allows me to wend our way and get a lead to there. The site has to actually have adequate pacing thresholds. It has to be in a location where I don't, unfortunately, concomitantly stimulate the phrenic nerve. I have to be able to, to deliver the lead deep enough 
so it doesn't displace, which still remains a significant challenge in CRT. I may want to use my own criteria for efficacy, such as the duration between the onset of the QRS and the electrogram onset at that location. And that might or might not match what I've been told pre-on. So even if we can get the most perfect imaging information, it doesn't mean necessarily that we can act on that information. Okay, let's leave for a moment uh, some of our frustrations. And as you can see, the theme of today's talk is going back and forth between those frustrations and, um, and the successes. So some simple things which are under the radar, which isn't gonna be very exciting to very many people, uh, but for us who are doing the implants, simple changes in the way we deliver the leads and the type of leads and uh, the way we can pace um, and what we can pace and uh, device-based algorithms and uh, getting rid of arrhythmias that compete with, with by B pacing really make big differences. So something as simple as this, uh, originally, when we started with CRT, we had a sheath to get into the CS. But getting into the CS is being in the left AV groove. You don't get CRT or ventricular pacing until you leave the main body of the CS and go to a desirable branch and basically do epicardial pacing of the LV by delivering a lead into the vein. But if you can't get into the vein, uh, you're just in the CS, you haven't gotten anywhere. So the use of subselection catheters and um, catheters within catheters within catheters and other tricks of the trade to deliver leads uh, to what were very challenging sites in the early days have really dramatically changed our success rate. Another simple advance is having different shaped leads, but more importantly, uh, having multiple electrodes. So today, 95% of the leads that we implant are now not unipolar leads and not bipolar leads, but are quadrupolar leads. So that you have a choice of up to four electrodes to pace from. And here's a, a great example. This is a patient uh, a while back in whom I mentioned the QLV, uh, of 30 milliseconds, which is not a very promising site for response. So that was at electrode one, but at electrode four, the QLV was 90 milliseconds. So I could deliver a lead deeply into the vein. So I don't have to worry about it pulling out, but not pace from an electrode that I'm unhappy with, but rather pace from an electrode that's more desirable. Also by having multiple electrodes, there is data now on patients with non-responders that we can convert at least a percentage of those non-responders to responders by doing multi-point pacing. That often we don't really know the most desirable place or we can, there's enough scar here that allows for a limited area of depolarization here, but not here. But if we could deliver energy to multiple spots, we might be able to convert a segment of the non-responder population into responders. And by having multiple electrodes um, to and eventually all the companies will allow for multi-point pacing as well. Let's look at another thing that the devices can do now. And again, compare it to our frustration with echo-guided CRT optimization. So why was it? not such a good tool. To be honest, I never had a lot of belief in it. And my view was number one, the logistics of just doing it and getting people to the lab and the long studies and using the programmer and trying to deal with competing rhythms and so forth was very challenging. But even if you could do it perfectly, and even if it was done perfectly, what you were doing was optimizing AV and VV timing in a supine patient in one adrenergic state, in one volume state, who may or may not have their medications adjusted after this is set. 
the idea that that optimized setting would translate into what happens on a day-to-day -day basis seemed to me to be a long shot. So what if instead you had a device, doesn't look at the hemodynamics, but at least looks at electrical parameters that correspond to hemodynamics? And what if it could be dynamically looking at those timings and adjust? Additionally, in general, we think of RV pacing as a bad thing, and we're doing biventricular pacing. Is it possible to find patient populations in which you pace the LV and try to fuse with conduction from the right, but not give RV pacing? And in fact, there are now companies that are using algorithms that try to achieve both. They try to allow for LV pacing only when it's appropriate, depending on intrinsic conduction uh, to the right side, but also allow for constant reassessment of optimal timing between the atrium and the ventricle or the ventricle and the ventricle. And there are at least a couple of very impressive reports showing again, yet another way that we can convert part of the non-responders into responders and perhaps convert some of the responders into better responders. So up until now, we've been focused on what we do. And what we do is basically LV epicardial pacing in the LV that we accomplish through pacing in the veins. Now we know, and especially early on, we had a significant number of patients it's happening, fortunately, much less frequently than it used to be, who had failed CRT attempts, and we sent for LV epicardial lead placement via the cardiothoracic team. Dr. DeRose here has um, done a number of cases, particularly with robotics, um, uh, as a bailout. And there's still a lot of interest within the CT surgical community. Are there better ways to deliver not and less invasively LV epicardial leads when they need to. Uh, it's of interest, it's of some importance, but hopefully this represents a very, very small percentage of the CRT population requiring this sort of uh, approach. Um, the somewhat ghoulish picture suggests uh, ideas, particularly, you know, the electrophysiologists are starting to visit the pericardium not only when we give tamponade on occasion, but the left atrial appendage closure devices for uh, epicardial VT ablation. Um, and perhaps we should start thinking about delivering epicardial leads into the pericardium where we don't get limited by the venous anatomy. There are many potential limitations in this. And probably post open heart patients with all fi uh, fibrosis and so forth, probably going to be very problematic. So, this is probably um, an area of interest. I don't really know how far that's ever going to go. Um, a very intriguing uh, picture of taking it to the most logical conclusion is only Dr. Astravatham the master electrophysiologist and anatomist could think of is a dog model where he could look at the various sinuses of the pericardium and try to deliver a quadrachamber device through the sinuses, anchoring them appropriately so that with a single wire pulled and pushed in the right way, you could pace and sense both atria and both ventricles. Phenomenal uh, uh, and ingenious approach. I'm not sure it's ever going to ever translate into human application. So that ends the world of epicardial pacing as we've discussed. I want to briefly mention uh, looking at the endocardium. So there are reasons to think of moving around the LV chamber is a lot easier and a lot freer and leads a lot more uh, flexibility where you wanna put the lead as 
compared to the coronary sinus anatomy. Um, also, uh, there's less scar. And so the ability to electrically deliver energy is often more efficient in the cardioly than epicardially. If one looks at activation time, uh, it is uh, accelerated by pacing endocardially rather than epicardially. And there are, um, in a study such as this, that looked at various types of bi -B pacing, multi-point pacing, and compared the best of them in this acute hemodynamic study to endocardial, and endocardial comfortably beat any of these options. So there's a lot of appeal to the idea of moving from the epicardium to the endocardium. Such, so much so that there was at least a multi-center trial done primarily in Europe with the daring and bold approach of actually putting wires, that which we consider anathema, into the LV chamber, not by going through the aortic valve, but by puncturing from um, transeptally uh, into the atrium and then into the RV and ingenious ways how to deliver it. And there is some data that uh, for patients who were non-responders or failed CRT patients, they in fact uh, could achieve pretty good results. Um, however, at a cost, particularly regarding thromboembolic events that I don't think in the long term is realistic uh, and except for perhaps exceptional situations, I don't think that is where the future of CRT lies. And, you know, just the nightmares of having chronic LV leads, um, somebody who does many extractions on the right side of the heart and deals with many of the complications of right-sided leads, don't even want to think about dealing with left-sided uh, lead complications. Well, what if you could do endocardial pacing without a lead in the LV? And in fact, that's what's being investigated right now. It's a bit of a crazy system, but it's, uh, it's now been done. And it's a system that basically says you need a pacemaker or a defibrillator in the atrium in the ventricle, in the right ventricle. But in the LV, what you do is not put in an LV lead through the coronary sinus and not put in an actual lead by transeptal puncture from the right to the left side of the heart, but just put an electrical seed in the LV that's much smaller than a typical even leadless pacemaker. Now, how do you then deliver energy to the LV? Well, then you have a battery source subcutaneously and an ultrasound energy delivery system so that there is triggering of this system to pace the LV when the RV senses. So you can get biventricular left endocardial pacing uh, with this system, albeit pretty complicated. In fact, there's even now one report of not having the pacemaker there, but getting CRTP by having an RV leadless pacemaker, I'm sorry, with the LV seed and then this system to, co to um, communicate with the pacemaker to pace the LV. This looks like a very, very intriguing approach. Um, more recent data is a little bit unsettling. We thought by having a little seed of a device rather than a lead, we could preclude the risk of, of thromboembolic events. That appears not yet to be the case. And even more disturbingly, a couple of these seeds have actually led to late LV perforation. So proof of concept is there. The technology, I don't believe, is there yet. So I'm going to close <clears throat> by moving to a totally different way and where a lot of the excitement and future development may lie, as well as plenty of controversy. So if I want to challenge the concept of CRT as we know it, I would say the following. Does CRT really deliver electrical synchronization? Or is it, are we really going backwards? We've improved AV timing and maybe VV timing. 
And that's really mostly what we've accomplished. And we actually haven't resynchronized the LV itself at all or minimally. I could argue, I haven't ever heard anybody say it this way, but if you think about it and are honest about it, LV pacing is really sort of a glorified PVC equivalent at a desirable spot that's not premature in the sense that it's, it's coordinated with the RV, but you are then depolarizing the LV through myocardial cell to cell conduction as you would in a PVC. So it's not surprising that QRS duration um, that we had hoped would get abbreviated is not often abbreviated that much. And it's not surprising that we have the high non-response rate that we do. So here's a perfect example. These are two cases I did on Monday. The first case is a patient with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, a left bundle branch block, uh, did not have a device. I put in a CRT-D. Um, I had a QLV here of about 120, 130 milliseconds, what I'm looking for, and a beautiful looking QRS. It's way too early for me to know whether she's going to be a responder, but this gives me a lot of optimism. In contrast, the patient I did in the afternoon, who also had a cure restoration of 150, albeit pace, and I put the LV lead in, perhaps not quite as pretty a place, but still got a QLV of about 120, 130 milliseconds. And this is what his resynchronized QRS looks like. And it went from 154 to actually prolonged. It's very different QRS. There's clearly evidence of left ventricular capture. Um, and the QRS is funny, and perhaps we are actually mismeasuring the QRS duration. But this is not a very reassuring picture um, that we've accomplished something. And so that's using end the epicardial coronary sinus guided placement of leads, looking at some parameters that we hope to measure efficacy, but with very different feelings about results. Well, what if we could do better? So this is not a CRT case, but actually one of the first his cases I ever did, a patient with a left bundle for 10 years, intermittent conduction abnormalities, also varying LV function, uh, needed a new lead, and decided to try to put a his lead in. And this is a beautiful local AHV. Uh, it says A lead, but this is actually the unipolar uh, v um, signal. Uh, and then I bump the conduction system. There's an A, there's a hiss, and there's actually a current of injury at the hiss. And then I actually get intermittent high-grade AV block, two-to-one block with infrahissian block. Uh, so disturbing acutely, but that EKG for 10 years looks like this and has stayed like this now for years with the QRS totally normalized and gave uh, a lot of us optimism that we could normalize left bundles in a lot of patients. And perhaps rather than go to the CS, we could normalize uh, the heart doing with his bundle pacing. Uh, there's been a lot of excitement about this. Dr. Uh, BJ Raman, who is really one of the superstars of uh, his bundle uh, pacing uh, is a graduate of our EP program and really one of our, our great uh, success stories. We take great pride and has done incredible work in this area, um, has uh, uh, pushed strongly for this approach and uh, data that was suggestive but not compelling. And yet I don't think the his bundle story is gonna turn out to be as we hoped. Um, number one, there are problems with his bundle pacing in general, you have high thresholds. Um, often they work acutely, don't work acutely, or they'll work, but only at very high outputs, leading to rapid battery depletion, um, complexity and in interpretation. But perhaps even more importantly in the CRT population, if your distal, if the problem with your left bundle is distal to the hiss, you're not gonna normalize the hiss. And for many patients, 
even getting a good hiss position with perfect parameters, the left bundle persists. So that's led now to uh, going one step further, one step more distally, and that is doing either left bundle pacing or left ventricular septal pacing. And there's a lot of excitement about this. I think I'm running out of time, so um, I'm going to um, fly through this a little bit, but there's acute hemodynamics uh, showing very, very suggestive data that left ventricular septal pacing or left ventricular bundle branch block uh, bundle pacing, um, even with tools that are not yet optimized to try to get true septal pacing, can in fact make a real difference that it may prove to be superior to his bundle pacing and may well prove to be superior or at least the equivalent of CS-based by ventricular pacing. And so that's where a lot of the excitement is headed. You look at some of the acute numbers and some of the acute titles to these things. And um, it actually, to me, borders on um, a little bit of, honestly, uh, disbelief. If you took it, some of these reports to the logical conclusion, um, and I'm sure my heart failure associates would go crazy with this thought, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with the left bundle is not myocardial disease. All it is is like heart block further south from the AV node, fix the heart block. You're basically, it's a pacemaker patient. You fix that heart block that's distal and you fix the disease. I think that is would be wonderful and almost certainly not true. So each of us has our own vested views, our own passions, our, our involvement in investigative trials or what we do, uh, but we need a little bit of humility um, and being open. And if we accept our limits, then that's a good chance we'll go beyond them. Uh, CRT is likely to look very different in the future. Hopefully, efficacy improves. Hopefully, re-engagement of the conduction system does turn out to be a major or the major way to deal with this. Leadless technology is going to be very good. But if I may uh, quote Winston Churchill at the beginning of the first British uh, military victories against the Nazis in World War II, he stated, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. It is perhaps the end of the beginning. I think that's where we are in CRT right now. I thank everybody for their attention and hopefully somebody who understands Zoom far better than I will be able to uh, uh, help us moderate at least some of the comments and questions. Um, thank you very much. So Jay, I'm still here um, uh, to moderate. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, presentation and uh, uh, excursus of uh, you know the history and the past, the present, and the future of CRT. So one question for you, you went through this very well is, you know, it looks like the human being have failed to identify identify which are the responders to the CRT. Whatever we have done, echo CRT, change the position, QRS duration, a lot of things have been tested. We know which patient respond better than the other, but we still can't say which are the patient that we can predict will respond to CRT. And, you know, you, you presented very well the complexity. We're in the world of artificial intelligence. Do you feel that maybe it's not us and maybe, you know, a, an artificial intelligent eye will be able to solve this matter? Um, so, um, you know, and I would really enjoy the perspectives of our heart failure colleagues. We look at heart failure. Let, let me tell you, you know, when I look at ICDs, the greatest strength of an ICD within limit is it doesn't care who you are or how you change. As long as you're within the limits of the machine, it can detect an arrhythmia and deliver a shock. If your EF drops, it works. If you develop a coronary disease, it works. If you're non-ischemic, it works. 
This device is looking to treat the underlying nature of the disease. You have different people, different people in different states of their lives, in different adrenergic states, in different volume states, and one way may not work. The beauty of automation, the beauty of maximizing everything we can do, multi-leads, uh, adjustable VV timing, adjustable AV timing, multi-point pacing can allow us to look at the inter-individual variation, not just in saying you belong to this population. If you had good enough AI, it could tell you, you benefit from multi-point pacing. You benefit from changing, from pacing from electrode four to electrode one. You benefit from having an AV delay of 130 milliseconds rather than 150 milliseconds. If you we could figure out a way to use every potential enhancement. And then we had a machine or machines that could do it automatically. Um, we might go much, much further for CRT. I don't think a single human being treating a single human being is going to be able to achieve that alone. Thank you. Second question, I'm reading a few questions and, uh, you know, coming back to you is, uh, you know, your personal opinion do you think that better technology and better leads and better you know no, no. met better thing from the company uh to put, to do his bundle pacing or uh left or uh, you know lbb pacing would be better than uh, we can do a lv lead with transeptal approach, assuming we can fix the problem of anticoagulation? So um, I, I think everything that I've seen in EP over the last 30 years got better with time, whether it's transvenous ICDs or AF ablation or rate modulation, everything got better. And that which was a long shot became a reality with technological advancement. So you can't underestimate better ways to do within the CS or better ways to engage the conduction system of uh, methods uh, knowing where the left bundle is, having the right depth, uh, and the, the length of the screw to go into left. I think those things are potentially transformational. But parallel to that technologic advancement, which makes a concept that is correct, much more effective, is proving that the concept is correct. And that's sort of the dual challenge that we've always had in the advancement of cardiology, whether it's uh, intervening on coronary lesions, whether it's um, ablating certain entities, and uh, or, or whether we're approaching CRT. And I think they both need to be done in parallel, but what we always have to be careful of is we don't want the technology driving the wisdom and we don't want the wisdom limited by a lack of advance in technology, but the two really have to advance simultaneously. There's a question from uh, the, uh, the audience. Is there any, uh, you know, survival benefit comparison between, uh, you know, LBB versus his bundle versus uh, CRT? No, the initial, the, the initial reports that are coming out now are looking at some of the early parameters that were looked at. They're looking at functional class improvement. They are looking at um, uh, remodeling, reverse remodeling parameters but there are really as of yet no randomized trials to look at conduction um, approaches to CRT versus, uh, versus uh, traditional CRT. And obviously that is gonna have to be done uh, to answer critical questions such as the one you just mentioned. Then, you know, for the sickness of time, I think uh, I wanna thank you again uh, I would like to conclude this that, you know, we will, uh, everybody can follow us on our uh, Montefiore YouTube channel for this uh, type of presentation. And I would like to close with the words of Dr. Gross. Uh, his quote was at the end was everything gets better with time. 
So just uh, live your life. Thank you very much, Jay, and uh, see you soon on the next uh, cardiology uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day.